Joining us for Mornings on the Hill, I'm Ford Hatchet. And I'm Samantha Croston. It's Wednesday, September 9th, and we're coming to you live from the NCC News Studio in Newhouse 2. Top story this hour, Syracuse University is beginning its second round of mandatory testing for students this week. Our Rob Flax joins us live. Good morning, Samantha. I'm here on the Syracuse quad. As you can see behind me, students are already lining up to get their COVID-19 testing. That's part of the second round of mandatory testing that started at 10 a.m. today and every day going into this week. And that's going to get those testing numbers for the COVID-19 dashboard up from the previous weeks. As Syracuse enters its third week of classes, students are required to take the now second round of COVID swab testing. Volunteer swabbing stations have been set up on the quad and south campus as Syracuse expands its pool saliva testing program throughout the week. Students say the testing makes them feel safe. I feel a lot safer on Syracuse's campus, especially with New York being so strict. And that sense of safety also comes from comparing SU's response to those of surrounding universities. But in the colonial, they have more like parties and they didn't uh, care about the like mask, like the uh, test. So they didn't control the situation as well. SU's current COVID-19 dashboard reports only two active cases with 20 students in quarantine. That's with trace amounts of COVID-19 found in Ernie Davis and Sadler residence halls. Rapid testing at both locations found no active cases. This COVID-19 testing site behind me might be the one place on campus where students won't have to wear a mask, at least temporarily. They'll be asked to take it off as they perform their mouth swab. And today, the first students who will be doing that is those from the Ernie Davis and Sadler Hall residences. That's because trace amounts of COVID-19 were found in the wastewater treatment. SU's COVID response manager, AJ Florkowski, says SU is working with Onondaga County to monitor wastewater off campus as well. A dorm room style lockdown such as Ernie Davis, he says, is possible. There's factors that go into that as well as far as like what the uh, the level is of the uh, the hit that comes back off the wastewater testing. If it's a very high level, um, I mean, maybe maybe it is a, something similar to Ernie Davis. If it's a very low level like Sadler, and maybe it's a response similar to what we saw at Sadler. He says the biggest risk to fall 2020 semester is complacency, I think, is going to be one of our biggest enemies. Um, I think, you know, we are doing pretty well right now. I think if we continue to do that, the, the fear of complacency, I think, will set in, uh, at least from my perspective and, and those around me. Um, you know, we just have to stay vigilant. We have to stay on top of it, realize that at any moment, uh, we, you know, we could hit a spike. And that spike in testing is why Florkowski says he needs volunteers. Right now, Syracuse University is working with Upstate Medical Hospital, and that means that turnaround times on testing could be as little as one day. But Florkowski says that number wouldn't hold if a large spike in cases happened. He'd need to mobilize people as soon as he could get them, and that's why he says students should pick up any hours they can get in order to get those testing in. He says that students should get that and as soon as they can, and students can go and even get extra credit for their assignments as well as college credit through the Arts and Health School if that's where they are a student. Rob Flax, mornings on the Thanks, Rob. Yeah, SU received a bit of a scare last week after traces of COVID-19 were found in the wastewater of two dorms. But that sewer surveillance isn't just for SU's campus. It's being used across Onondaga County and has become a crucial tool in fighting the virus. It's a strategy that was originally used decades ago to track and slow the spread of polio. But now the New York State Health Department has partnered with Syracuse-based Quadrant Biosciences to expand the testing to three new areas. Monitoring different wastewater facilities has helped isolate positive cases up to 10 days before someone exhibits symptoms in a plan announced by County Executive Ryan McMahon in April. We're tracking it. We, we see it. We see COVID in Oak Orchard. We know that it's in clay, right? Across campus, students are limiting the spread of COVID-19 by social distancing and wearing masks. But reporter Sarah Alshay tells us that for one SU student, what was supposed to protect her from getting sick got her sick. It's not something that'll just go away. And the doctor told me that, my mom told me that, that it just wasn't gonna just go away. So 
I had to go get it looked at. Riley Didier had a fever at the end of her first week back on campus. Her first thought was COVID-19, but once she got a rash on her ear, she knew it was something else. So I ended up going to urgent care and they said that I had cellulitis. Riley says she was surprised to find out the masks she's been wearing to help her not get sick ended up being how she got sick. It was too tight and it rubbed the back of my ear and I had a sore on the back and then it just got worse. Riley says she's only going to be using disposable masks from now on to not risk getting another infection, but with so many masks to choose from, which one is best? According to the CDC's website, you should wear masks with two or more layers of washable, breathable fabric that cover your nose and mouth and don't have gaps. For Riley, after two weeks of antibiotics, her and her ear are back to normal. Her advice to other students if they feel some discomfort on the back of their ears? Disposable, um, switch it out every day or a couple times a day. In Syracuse, New York, Sarah Alsheh, Mornings on the Hill. Hard to believe your mask can get you sick. Thanks, Sarah. SU students will now be given the opportunity to work in collaboration with the Department of Public Safety to offer their feedback and recommendation for their current initiatives. The Student Association will be working with a local nonprofit group, Interfaith Works Central New York, to conduct daily Zoom and weekly daily and weekly Zoom sessions discussing topics ranging from race to COVID-19. As the protest in Rochester played out this past weekend, our Maya Lockett was on the scene, and Maya joins us live now to provide an update on the movement. Maya. Thank you, Ford. There's just been a major announcement in Rochester just a few days after the protest. Mayor Lovely Warren has just announced that the entire Rochester Police Department's command staff is resigning, including the chief of police. Rochester is only an hour away from Syracuse, so it hits home for a lot of students here. Students have gathered six nights in a row in Rochester, New York, after the story of Daniel Prude, who died after being restrained by Rochester Police Department officers in March, was released on September 2nd. This is a human being with a spirit and a soul and a mind and a body. And then to see them put a bag over his head and to see them laugh, it's just so inhumane. People from all over came to Rochester to fight for equality and justice for Daniel Prude. If we don't make a change, things won't change. But many believe that there will not be any change if people do not understand the purpose of the Black Lives Matters protest. If they don't understand our walk. They're not empathetic and put themselves. Suppose they were on the other side of this place. How would they feel if it was their son, their brother? After several days of tense demonstrations, protesters have found different ways to protect themselves. Protesters are having to use leaf blowers to blow away the tear gas that will be released on them. I can't understand why they would think they have to use such unnecessary force against people with umbrellas and tub tubs. Protesters plan to continue their fight until justice Daniel is served Prude. for Daniel Prude. Just thinking about Daniel Prude, um, and his family, and that they'll never get to see him again. For Mornings on the Hill, I'm Maya Lockett. When I went to Rochester, I was able to see the pain in the community that they are dealing with there. And the organizers made it so known that they just wanted a peaceful protest to get their voices heard in the community. And one thing that stood out to me were the amount of mothers that were there that were fighting for justice for Daniel Prude, but also trying to prevent this from happening to their sons. And the protesters, the protesters made it known that they will not stop fighting for justice until everyone who was responsible for the death of Daniel Prude is held accountable. Thank you. I'm Maya Lockett, and this is Mornings on the Hill. This past Friday, residents at Day Hall got a scare when a package was discovered in the mailroom with a racial slur written on it. DPS Chief Bobby Maldonado released a statement yesterday saying the writing did not come from Day Hall and that the package likely arrived on campus with the slur already written. Day Hall was the subject of multiple incidents of racist graffiti last year, sparking the Not Again SU movement. Its freshman residents had a lot to say about the package. It's more than anything, it's just why do these things 
keep happening. As freshmen, we should all like be very like welcoming and like have like a strong community. So yeah, it's just a little frightening. I thought with the rise of like the Not Again SU movement, people that were attending Syracuse were a lot more racially sensitive about things like this. So it surprised me to see something like that happening again. Saying, quote, hate does not belong at Syracuse University. Good to see that. And coming up on Mornings on the Hill, student clubs are still recruiting new members this year, just not in person. With Sierra Ryder. How's it feeling out there, Sierra? Hi, Samantha. Well, temperatures are heating up on campus and it's just going to get hotter. So you're going to have to stick around for the full weather forecast and so much more coming up on Mornings on the Hill. Welcome back. And for those of you looking for today's forecast, our Sierra Ryder is live out on University Avenue to tell us what to expect. Sierra, what's it looking like out there? Hi, Samantha and Ford. If you are just getting out the door, you can ditch that jacket because it is going to be hot and humid today. It's already at 75 degrees and the temperatures are just going to keep going up. So let's take a look at the forecast. Taking a look at the temperatures today, it is 90% humidity with a slight wind coming out of the east. The high will be 86 degrees around 4 p.m. this afternoon. It will cool down to near 72 degrees later this evening. Your sunset tonight is at 720. So what's going on tomorrow? Well, starting your Thursday off with high 60s, but that won't last for long. By the late morning, temp will reach 79 degrees with sunny skies overhead, still increasing to 82 degrees in the afternoon. So not quite as hot as today, but you will still feel it. And now onto the rest of the week. Look at those numbers. It is cooling down for us. Lows in the 50s on Friday with a high of just 70 degrees. Still mostly sunny skies, so that's good news. And then onto your weekend, we have a high of 77 on Saturday with some slight cloud cover. Rain sun on Sunday with some showers that's heading your way. 70% chance of rain in the morning, and that will fall to a 50% chance in the afternoon. A high of 74 and a low of 59. So a temperature check right now, it's 75 degrees, but it's going to keep increasing. And I might have to go back to the studio and join you guys in my air conditioning pretty soon. Back to you. As we mentioned before, many campus services are not quite the same as when you departed campus last spring. For instance, counseling services at the Barnes Center. There are a few new guidelines in place to keep you safe. Now, one of the biggest changes is that drop-in appointments are not available this semester. Additionally, initial appointments will be done over the phone or Zoom. For in-person visits, a wellness triage will be required. Masks and social distancing are required at all times in the building. And a new COVID-19 grief and loss group counseling session is available to students. For the latest information on changes at the Barnes Center, you can visit their Twitter at BeWellSU and call the number on the screen for an appointment. The Syracuse Student Activities Fair was held last week and it looked a little different than usual. Instead of the one day fair on the quad featuring hundreds of organizations, this year's, this year's fair was virtual with around 50 clubs represented on each day. Associate Director of Student Activities Tim Johnson says this year will look a little different. We made sure that all of our student orgs when they registered updated all the information about meeting times, contact and all that. So if a student group can't go to something, um, they can definitely reach out to that group individually and jump into their own meeting times. So the last thing I'll say, I think in, in all the programming throughout campus, like if, if students, you know, really give it a chance to work, I think it could be a really great space to still have some interaction and some fun. I'm a little concerned about like being able to connect with people like virtually in clubs, but I think I think it I think everybody's learning and I think it'll work out in the end. Now, student club organizers say that the virtual format, while it's not ideal, it did bring in some new club signups, but they still prefer the in-person fair. Coming up on Mornings on the Hill, Syracuse football kicks Closer off their regular the season. Line and work. In Chapel Hill, Syracuse football kicks off their regular season this weekend in Chapel Hill. We'll take a look at how the Orange are getting prepared.
Good morning, I'm Josh Miller with your Orange Sports Update here on Mornings on the Hill. College football is back for Syracuse University this week. The Orange have been hard at work since June preparing for this season. The biggest question for this team is if the offensive line can keep quarterback Tommy DeVito safe while establishing a healthy run game. Head coach Dino Babers spoke about the group and what they need to do to be successful. The offensive linemen work together all the time. You know, they're like they're the left hand and your right hand working together. And they really got to have a feel for each other if they're really going to be uh, uh, above average, so to speak. Top spot in the FBS for interceptions. Defensively, it will be a transitional season for the Orange as they have changed to a new defensive scheme under new defensive coordinator Tony White. The first test for this team comes this Saturday at noon as the Orange take on 18th ranked UNC Chapel Hill down in North Carolina. The Tar Heels and Orange last met in 2018 where the Orange won in dramatic fashion in double overtime. This year, the Orange are a 22 point underdog to the Tar Heels, but are hoping to start the season off with an upset. Now over to Matt Majinski for a pro sports update on former SU basketball player Elijah Hughes. Two, one, two. The NBA decided to postpone the draft once again as coronavirus continues to alter sports schedules. But for former Syracuse basketball star Elijah Hughes, draft night can't come soon enough. The former star elected to forego his senior season on the hill and instead embark on his professional basketball journey. I was able to speak with Miami Hurricanes assistant coach Chris Caputo, who talked about new skill sets. In the wake of several social justice movements across the country, the ACC has released three initiatives to be taken up by its member schools. According to a press release from the ACC, the initiatives include mandatory diversity and inclusion training for student athletes and athletic department staff. The ACC's Committee for Racial and Social Justice created the initiatives to move the conference towards its goal of creating meaningful, lasting social change. The conference's committee has also introduced a unity statement, which will be read before all ACC events. The statement reads in part, we the ACC are committed to seeing each other as equals, supporting each other and treating each other with respect and dignity at all times. And with the ACC is committed to holding its fall season despite the pandemic, Stephen Shoemaker joins us live with how university club sports are faring this semester. Stephen? Syracuse University has over 40 club sports teams, but with everything going on on campus, nothing is promised in the day and age of COVID-19. The university is starting to allow larger public group gatherings to occur as they want their students to have the opportunities they normally would be having if not for the virus. Club sports like tennis, baseball, and softball have the green light to start practicing as they are outdoor sports that are distant from one another. I was able to sit down and speak with Ryan Clark, who's one of the captains of the club tennis team. He explained to me how they practice only twice a week and can have anywhere from 20 to 50 players on their roster. They have a dozen outdoor courts, so they are able to practice and be socially distant from one another. All players are required to wear their masks at all times. It's nice to see that club sports are slowly but surely making their way back onto Syracuse's campus. Reporting live from Mornings on the Hill, I'm Stephen Shoemaker. Back to you guys in the studio. Thanks, Stephen. Returning to Matt live once more for a look at Syracuse's local high school sports. Matt? Three, Go. two, Again? one. And a New York State high school sports may look a little bit different this year. The New York State Public High School Athletic Association decided on a new start date to the season. That new start date will be September 21st, so teams will have a couple more weeks to get ready for practice. But until then, at 3 p.m. After, this afternoon, there is going to be a meeting so they can discuss any other plans that may need to be taken in case there is going to be another COVID outbreak. But until then, high school sports are around the corner in New York State. A new segment here on Mornings on the Hill, Game of the Week. We will pick a game for you to watch and recap it on our next show. This first week's Game of the Week was Monday night's BYU versus Navy college football matchup. 
BYU got started early and well, they never really stopped. Starting off the action in the first quarter, the run game was working for BYU. Tyler Algier gets the party started with a 34 yard rushing touchdown to put BYU up seven. Not even three minutes later, Lopini Katoa says, hey, I want my own. Katoa with his own 39 yard rushing touchdown. BYU up 14 in just the first quarter. Not only was BYU's offense clicking, but its defense, Navy couldn't get anything going offensively. Big stop here for BYU's defense on fourth down that set the tone early. Navy was held to only a field goal the entire game. BYU started to run away with this one. Zach Wilson to Gunnar Romney and well, Romney does the rest. A 45 yard touchdown and things started to get ugly. BYU would end up winning with a final score of 55 to three, the first win of the season for BYU. Be sure to check out the new game of the week. We stay on the gridiron as the NFL returns. The returning Super Bowl champion Kansas City Chiefs take on the Houston Texans tomorrow night for some much needed Thursday night football. Have a different game you're watching out for this week? Tweet us at Mornings on the Hill Twitter with your can't miss game. Thanks, John. Still to come here on Mornings on the Hill. A big step in getting ready for local elections is taking place today. That story and more just ahead. Stay with us. Welcome back. With just 55 days until the November election, Mornings on the Hill political reporter Ryan Clark is live with us this morning. And Ryan, today's a big day in local politics, isn't it? Thanks, Ford. Well, it certainly is because today marks the first day of new campaigns in Onondaga County. According to the Onondaga County Board of Elections, the final candidate nominations have been finalized and will be being released by noon today. After that announcement, expect to see more campaign strategies and campaign promises released by those new campaigns. Within the next 24 hours or so, there will be new nominations in the Onondaga County government. And it's a big day for local politics with early voting slated to begin on October 24th. The ballot will be finalized by the afternoon today. The offices that will be filled include two New York State Senate seats, five seats on the State Assembly, and three town justices, along with the already finalized congressional representative race of John Katko and Dana Balter. Others include tax collectors, county members, and ward counselors. But don't forget about the town justices. Those are the only ones solely responsible for the local criminal mischief and locking down crime in your community. And these nominations come just days before local polling sites are set to be released. I talked to campaign and elections officials yesterday, and they ensured me that local polling sites will be up and running as soon as possible to ensure that all Syracuse residents have the right to vote. And well, that right to vote might be coming sooner than you think. The elections officials confirmed to me that they will be setting up polling sites as early as October 1st, just three weeks ahead of now. Be on the lookout for more information from the Board of Elections within the next few weeks regarding early voting. Reporting live from Mornings on the Hill, I'm Ryan Clark. SU students are back, but for some businesses, it's still not enough. Marshall Street, one of SU's most popular destinations, is open. But this year, the street looks a little emptier. Peter Mavrakides, the owner of Acropolis Pizza, says that despite the return of students, his business and others are struggling to get by. I believe that every business in this street is the same situation. They're all, some places they close for three months, they don't even open. Some big places they open one day, they close early, you know, it's not easy. Mavrakidi says that if a vaccine isn't found by the end of the year, he may be forced to close down. Despite his business situation, he still sees the silver lining. It's a sad story, but you know, you gotta look at it this way, the other people, die and we're alive and that's that's a, a blessing you know what i'm saying that's how i look at it renovations have been ongoing at the shine center since last fall our xavier brown joins us live to tell us what will be different at the student center once the construction is completed the workers up here at the shine student center have been working since daybreak this morning construction here on Construction here on campus has been going since May of 2019 and is about 70% complete at the moment, set to be finished sometime in September. I haven't done, but I really just go in there to buy food and there's other options. Let me know when the start ends. 
When all uh, is said and done, the center will feature a better student experience. Um, I can wait, really. I'm not too anxious for it. Okay. A few of these upgrades include space created to help students Something with disabilities, like space for multicultural year, affairs, as well as a space for the LGBT that, community. Really the aesthetic was also a focal point. Paint and natural light have started to be applied for the uh, to, for the building to be more welcoming. Xavier Brown reporting here for Mornings on the Hill. S student designers are making their impact on campus despite the pandemic. Our Sierra Williams is live to tell us more. Top Cycle has nine brands, all found by students. Chief Marketing Officer Jackson Inslee says their ultimate goal is to make sure students' work is public. What we're doing is we just want to kind of give, give those young brands a platform to, to meet new customers and get eyes on them that they wouldn't have before. So we really think that we're doing a great job at that. Adora Ellis has been with Pop Cycle for two years and has been able to create her own brand, Lave. She says the recognition from Pop Cycle has been nothing but positive. Every time it, it leaves me speechless, but it also like it makes me feel like I accomplished what I hope to when creating the piece. Like I want it, it to be a thing where people buy it and it sells out and they just love it or they always like inbox me like, hey, I love what I got from you. So it's just like a really it's a priceless and unexplainable feeling whenever I do get it. Pop Cycle co-founder Ben Goldsmith says they create clothing that incorporates quality, style, and comfort mainly for their biggest consumers. Students should shop Pop Cycle because they're supporting their own fellow students, and that's a huge thing to do. Pop Cycle launched their e-commerce website on Monday evening that includes curbside pickup. In Syracuse, Sayer Williams, Mornings on the Hill. Back to you, Ford. Finally this morning, the annual on-campus concert Juice Jam is going virtual this weekend. The show will be headlined by rap star A Boogie with the Hoodie. Ari Lennox and Beach Bunny will also make appearances. The concert will be pre-recorded and uploaded to YouTube on Sunday night. Students looking to virtually attend still need to RSVP with student activities in order to get the link. University Union, who organizes the event, will hold giveaways on the quad at lunch beginning today and running through Saturday for anyone who has RSVP'd. And that's going to do it for us this morning. On this Wednesday, it's Mornings on the Hill. I'm Ford Hatchett. Be sure to follow us on social media for the latest. I'm Samantha Croston. Thanks for watching Orange Nation. We'll see you next Wednesday, live at 10 a.m. right here on OTN.